Hello! Welcome back to Stories from the Ashes, where we pontificate on good books and stories that define and refine us. I'm Amber, and I'm here today with Amanda and author M.L. Farb, who we will get to know as Maria. Thank you so much for joining us today, Maria. I'm so looking forward to our conversation. I'm excited to be here. Would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes. So I'm an adventurous introvert. Ever since I climbed up to the rafters of our barn at age four, I've lived high adventure, scuba diving, climbing, rappelling, and even riding a retired racehorse at full gallop. It was amazing. However, I dislike roller coasters and bungee jumping. One time was enough for bungee jumping. I don't like the sense of falling. I think one time would be too much for me for bungee jumping. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's fun. And then I tried to was like, oh, uh, no, that was not fun. Yeah. No. I like watching videos of other people bungee jumping. That is more than enough for me. <laughs> My husband would like to bungee jump, but he's not allowed to till the children are fully grown. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's all, it's My all grandma, she wanted to go skydiving. And when she turned 70, she was like, I guess I'm too old. I guess I won't in no. this life. No. That's why you do it. That's yeah, at, exactly. at the end of your life. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes, I like adventure, but not falling. I also enjoy learning in all areas of life. I took calculus at a community college at at age 14. I planned to go to MIT and become an astronaut. Plans changed in wonderful ways. Instead, I majored in English, married my sweetheart, and I am in the midst of raising our six children. They are my first and most beautiful stories. Oh, amen to that. That's awesome. I love that. Writing books or being an astronaut? I'm waiting for astronauts to land in some of your books. And then we'll see. Then we'll see the full circle come around there. (laughs) (laughs) So what are some books that have been influential to you in your life? I have learned so much from Les Miserables. It has helped me deeply consider societal issues and my role in a world with no easy answers. I especially appreciate the contrast between Javert and Jean Valjean. Javert never really thought, but blindly followed, and when he was confronted with two irreconcilable choices, it destroyed him. But Jean Valjean was always thinking and weighing both sides and making choices based on his in-depth analysis, both mental and moral. So Les Mis is really high reading level. Did you start liking to read when you were really young, or did you always love to read, or did you just jump in at Les Mis? Oh, no, it did not jump in at Les Mis. Um, so I've always loved stories. Some of my earliest memories were lying on the carpet listening to my dad read, and he introduced me to some of these higher level stories. Um, we explored the worlds of Narnia and Middle Earth. We cried with Cory Ten Boom in The Hiding Place. And that one, that's another book that just has always had a special place in my heart. Um, we also did a lot of adventure books. We voyaged with the Contiki and to grasp beyond the mountains. I love true life um, stories that have these adventures and these surviving unimaginable things, but also people who just make choices to be good, like in the hiding place, mm-hmm. no matter yeah, what. My mom read a lot of Cory Ten Boom's books to me as a kid, and they are very powerful and formative books for, I think, anyone at any any age that they read them at, I obviously don't recommend most of them for young kids because they're pretty intense, but they're definitely, they don't stop being powerful at any point. Who's your favorite author? Oh, I cannot pick a favorite author. So <laughs> it's an author. unfair question. <laughs> it is an unfair question. Some of my favorite authors are, in no particular order, Jerry Spinelli, Cory Tenboom, Victor Hugo. Ralph Moody, C.S. Lewis, J.R.R. Tolkien, John Flanagan, and Linda Sue Park. And that just does a huge variety of genres. Yeah, that's a very, very wide spread. I was going to say, I like seeing Jerry Spinelli in with some of those others. I really appreciated reading Jerry's books when I was a kid. And I think the last one that I read was Stargirl when I was 20 or 21, whenever it came out. And then I just haven't. I didn't read middle grade fiction for a long time after that. And then I started reading Spinelli's books again in the last year. And I was like, 
this is why I love Spinelli. I don't know why I took a break. I think that these are books I could have just kept on reading. So I like seeing it. This isn't to a certain age. It's universal. Yeah, yeah. The so many universal, are. just mankind, um, human nature stories that I, mm -hmm. I really appreciate. So, Maria, when did you start writing? Did you, how did you go from being a reader to a writer? How did you make that transition? Okay, so I actually did not like writing for the longest time. Um, I really started writing when I was 17. But previous to that, um, I think it was around when I was 15, I started telling stories to my little sisters to help them to go to sleep at night. I just make up stories. And it was a lot of fun, and it kind of backfired because we didn't go to sleep. We stayed up way too <laughs> late <laughs> making up these stories. I wish I had a big sister like that. It was so much fun. Uh, my first novel, The King's Trial, was born in those late whispered nights. So Halibant and Joseph, Galliard and Katrin, they were around when I was 15. <laughs> it was Aww. It was like... I made them up then, and then they kind of sat back burner for a long time. And then I was like, I need to write that story. And they were still there. Yeah. So what kind like of genres friends? do you... Old friends yeah, coming old back friends. when you when you wrote yes. them. <laughs> so what kind of genres do you write? What was the genre for that first one? And then do you write all the same genre? Okay, so the first one was very much high adventure, fantasy, uh, one of my friends said, it's not high fantasy because there's no dragons, but... <laughs> <laughs> it has to have dragons. And that's what my friend said. I was like, okay, so it's not high fantasy, but it's fantasy. Okay. <laughs> um, so the more... I just write what I like to read, and I like to have... I like classic fantasy, and I like historical fantasy, so that's what I write. It's a blend of those two. And I also like fairy tale retellings, so I mix in a lot of fairy tale elements into my stories. Oh, that's awesome. I've I've loved learning about these fairy tales I had no idea existed when I've been reading some of your books. It's it opens up your world so much. Thank but you. how do you how do you get the ideas for these for all your books? Do you so are I, you constantly combing fairy tale collections or Well, I'm a mom. I read out loud to my kids a lot, so I get exposed to so many new stories, and I go, oh, that's a great story idea. So I gather ideas from fairy tales, from myths, from life incidences, conversations, dreams, and even playing around with the meaning of a word. For example, in Fourth Sister, uh, it was inspired by the double meaning of the Japanese word she, S-H-I, which means both fourth and death. I combined the idea with elements from the picture book, The Five Chinese Brothers. Whereas Heartless Hetty was started by my oldest son telling of a dream he had of a sorcerer who stole half of a princess's heart, I used his idea with his permission and combined it with elements from the fairy tale, The Princess Who Never Laughed. That's really cool. I love modern fairy tales and fairy tale retellings, and I definitely was Me able too. to to pick out the threads of other fairy tales and mythology that was touching in on Vasilisa when I read it. Mm -hmm. It was fun to put in uh, the girl and her seven brothers and the swans. You saw mm -hmm. that one? <laughs> oh, yes. cool. I'm, yeah, I haven't read that yet. I'm looking that forward to it. That one just lightly touched on in there. Amanda's like, like, stop oh, talking so about it. Movies. Stop talking about it. I don't want any spoilers. That's Amanda all the time. <laughs> I know. I don't want any spoilers. I don't, I don't like spoilers. I try not to give them out as much as possible. So without spoilers, what's the favorite book that you've written? Oh, um, I'm going to respond with my 13-year-old daughter's wisdom. When I told her I couldn't pick a favorite of my books, she asked, Mom, do you have a favorite friend? And I was like, oh, uh, yeah, my books are very much like friends, each with her own unique personality. Fair, Fair enough. enough. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> so which of your books was the hardest one to write? Uh, Heartless Hete. This book deals with some heavy subjects such as the difference between faults and real love. Also, the main character, Hete, starts out very broken and closed off emotionally. I wanted to keep the balance right such that it could still be read as a family, 
However, I'd say this one is age 12 and up for individual reading. I appreciate that. And I that. expect anyone who reads it probably is going to have a lot of discussion. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I like being able to hold back some books like that, that maybe a simpler, a lower reading level, but a higher um, emotional and intellectual level. That's really good mm -hmm. for, for my dyslexic kids, especially because you don't want you don't want to run out of the good books. Like there's no reason to read all the good books that are sitting there for high schoolers and junior hires just when they're younger, just because they can. I feel like a lot of people just rush into some of those books. Like, Oh, I, I understand completely. Like if it's your favorite book personally, from when you were a child, you want to read it to your kid right away. But it's like, but there's so many books that are great for eight and 10 year olds. So we could just hold this one a little bit more and have something great when that kid's 12 that they can look forward to. My daughter's 15 mm -hmm. right now, and there's a stack on the shelf of when you are 16 books. And she's like, what's the difference between now and then? And I was like, not really a whole lot, honestly. But there's so many books on your 15-year-old shelf that you might skip if you wait until you're 16. Mm -hmm. so, so that's what we do. You mentioned in your acknowledgments in Vasilisa the six months that you spent teaching English to Russian kindergartners when you were younger, before you got married. And that familiarity with Russia definitely came through clearly in the story that you wrote. So if you don't count living in a foreign country as book research, which of your books was the one that required the most research? A fourth sister. Uh, I have some Japanese family members. My husband is part Japanese. And so okay. I did a lot of asking them questions. I also... Uh, research the fighting technique of the naginata. And the naginata is a combination of a spear and a katana and was used by Japanese women to defend their villages when the men were gone. I had I so that. much fun watching yeah. naginata matches to be able to write <laughs> the scenes for it. Um, I also researched the protocol of a tea ceremony. It's so beautiful. How to make a haiku riddle, the steps of mask making, and much more. It was a delightful journey. Um, I wonder else. Oh, go on. Sorry. I wanted to ask you about the mask making. I found it fascinating how all like a cracked mask, they would inlay gold into it. Was that common practice? Actually, they, it was common practice for bowls and pottery. Okay. They would fix it with this gold um, glue. And they considered the cracked bowl that was mended more beautiful than the bowl before it was cracked. That was just so fascinating. I, I found so much of the fourth sister fascinating and I learned so much from it. Thank you. I, I absolutely love the culture and I love the things that I can learn from any culture. There's beautiful things in every single culture that I can learn from. So I wanted to know more about how you picture names for these books. They're, there's they're very different than what we're used I'm used to seeing in uh, you know English books. Um, but how did you how do you find those names? So I pull names from the nationalities that are similar to my story world. In the King's Trial duology, I chose Arabic names for the Kishkarish, Scandinavian names for Lanzametsa, and Egyptian names for the Karani. However, Yosef, Halibant, Katrin, and Galliard are names I made up for those characters when I was a teen, so they have no cultural roots. <laughs> Very <laughs> nice. Just like, that's their names. Yeah, yeah. I believe that uh, when naming I, is one of the most important jobs just in life. And so I I love the the effort that authors go into to go beyond, you know, Joe, Jane, and Steve. <laughs> so. <laughs> so when I can, I pick names with meanings that align with the character. And I've done that a lot with the Hearth and Bard books. Mm -hmm. uh, in Fourth Sister, I chose names for each of the seven sisters that combine both the Japanese number corresponding with their birth order and their main personality. I have a spreadsheet with categories of birth order, name, name meaning based on the kanji, attributes, strengths, weaknesses, and a Japanese aesthetic that they align with. Very cool. Wow. Um, that's my math geek coming out. I like spreadsheets. Yeah, yeah. I like spreadsheets too. Yeah. I think, mm -hmm. is it Hite? Hete? Hete. Hete, I think she would like spreadsheets if she lived in our world, too. Oh, yes. <laughs> so you use riddles a lot. And I have I found the one in the King's Trial just fascinating so far. But how do you work those in? How do you come up with them? 
Well, I really like riddles and puzzles. That's something that I do all the time with my husband and kids. Um, and I like to reverse engineer from the ending that I'm aiming for. I know where I want to get to, so I write in the clues to get there. In the King's Trial, I created a set of riddles that were to guide the character through a deadly maze. And I actually didn't know what the riddles referred to. I was like, okay, I'm just going to write these riddles. And then (laughs) I wrote the scenes that fit the riddles. Wow. It was so much fun to explore ideas that way. Yeah, it was fun to read that and just kind of, you know, you get in the character's mind and you walk with them through whatever they're going through. But it's really fun to get in the character's mind when they're going through a riddle and and just exploring that. It was, it was really fun. Oh, it was wonderful. really, really fun. So, so I am not able to come up with all the riddles myself. I actually do a lot of brainstorming with my husband and children. They helped with the riddles for Heartless Hete and the haiku riddles for Fourth Sister. There was a lot of dinners where we got our whiteboard out. Actually, it's permanently on the wall, but we <laughs> got our markers and we were writing down ideas and it was so much fun. They have a great collective genius. So it's oh not just God. me writing these books. They definitely <laughs> contribute to it. That's awesome. That's a family affair. So one thing I've noticed about the Hearth and Bard Tales is that they're very, at least the first two that I've read, are very different parts of the world. Um, so how do they connect together? Okay, wonderful question. Each novel is a standalone tale based in the culture of a different part of the world. However, they are connected by a bard who introduces each tale. I will give the bard's own story as the last book in the series. Okay. That's wonderful. I I wonder if, obviously, they're your stories, but they're also the bard's stories. And do you ever have um, people who've read your books and fans that write in and are, like, upset at how the story ended and want you to? To rewrite it or go in a different direction or protest no. how a character went? No? No, I actually, the biggest thing I get from readers are like, you. I didn't want the story to end. I wanted oh, more. I yeah. love the character so much and I want more. So I wrote a novelette for each of my Hearth and Bard tales to give some after story. And I've also had uh, one reader who sent me pages of ideas for a third King Trial <laughs> book because he really wants to see the characters again. He's like, when are you going to write a third book? And I'm like, I hadn't planned on it. And he's like, please. <laughs> well, you always can later. Yes. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, when you're writing, do you have a clear view of the ending? You were saying how you reverse engineer with the riddles sometimes, but do you have a clear end, clear ending and view when you start, or are there multiple paths that the story could take? Okay, so I often write the ending first. It becomes the target for the rest of my story. Then Start I write where the you're beginning. Going. I like it. Yeah. And I then I write the beginning and mirror the two so it shows the completed journey and how the main character has changed. The in between, however, is in constant flux as I discover <laughs> different ways to reach the ending. The most common change in the middle is the introduction of unplanned characters that enrich the story and help the main character to grow. Um, so, like in Heartless Hetty, there's a character that shows up that I'd only planned on him being in that one scene. And after I had him in that one scene, I was like, wait a minute, he can't drop out now. He needs to continue <laughs> on the journey with him. Wait, is it the is it the uh, amphibian-like character? Yes. <gasps> he was not going to be there after that. That's awesome. I Yeah, that's, that's awesome. That's he, I like the way he continued on. I'm glad you kept him. He, like, he really seemed have a place yes he he needed to be there Mm -hmm. good do you ever wish that you chose a different ending for your books do you ever have and enders regret no i i don't um maybe because i always start with ending in mind Mm -hmm. uh however i did have a couple people who felt like the battle scene in the king's shadow uh needed a little bit more not more fighting but more depth in how it was resolved. And so I went through and added some more in and republished that. Oh, very But that wasn't cool. the ending of the book. It was right. you know, a yeah. climactic scene in the middle. So there's copies of both versions floating around out there, right? So uh, yes, note collectors. <laughs> <I guess> so. <laughs> 
So how do you write all the different types of characters? Because you've got a pretty broad range of, they're not all the same. They're very different. And how do you write them and keep them consistent with themselves? So I feel like character development is the most important part of my story. And so I study and research them until they become vivid friends. It's like I know them inside and out or enemies. (laughs) <laughs> I've taken personality tests and interviewed them, answering as I think they would. Once I know them, they very much guide the story. Once I had a character who was going to swear, and I'd already decided that I won't write swearing into my books. That's just one of the things that I decided I'm not going to do. But I also couldn't write him out a character, so I wrote a situation to stop him. That unplanned turn of events influenced the rest of his character arc. Oh, very So nice. what book was that? The King's Trial. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I really it was appreciate. Relevant. Yeah, I've appreciated how you keep your characters true to themselves. There's really nothing more mm-hmm. annoying than a character who starts the story as an introvert and ends it as an extrovert. Mm-hmm. That always frustrates me because that's not character growth. That's sci-fi body swapping. <laughs> so, like, I'm yeah. such an introvert. Yeah, yeah. 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 So I appreciate so how your you... how your characters all stay true to themselves, and instead, there's just the growth and maturing that Mm -hmm. we see in them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So do you see pieces of yourself in your characters or are they totally separate? Okay. Some are totally separate. And those are some of the hardest ones to write because I'm like, okay, I cannot write it making a decision that I would. I need to write it as they would decide. Uh Uh, However, there are some that definitely have pieces of me in them. So I relate to Vasilisa so much. We are both adventurous and we really don't fit socially. We are both stronger than we look. Yet at times I'm very much like Hete. This is the math geek in me. Uh I like things and people to be logical. It frustrates me when people make illogical arguments or use emotion to justify thoughtless actions. Um, And Josef, he had a lot of questions in The King's Trial and The King's Shadow, and a lot of those came from my own questions that I've pondered on over the years. I really liked Hete just because I tend to be a pretty black and white thinker, and so I really related to her in a lot of those, in a lot of ways. It was so much fun to write. (laughs) Yes. So... Do you ever write characters for your readers to connect with or to identify with? Or is that not a consideration that you're going for? My main purpose isn't for a reader to find a character just like him or herself. Rather, I strive to create characters who are believable, complex, and flawed with complicated relationships to help readers see people outside of their own experience and gain greater understanding and compassion. I mean, that's one reason I feel like reading is so important. I want to get outside my own experiences when I read. I want to be able to see the world from a different viewpoint so I'm not narrow-minded. Yeah. So the characters may not even be likable at the beginning because they have so far to grow. That was the case for both Halibant and for Hete. Readers, I have had a lot of readers say that these are some of their favorite characters because of their growth. Mm Mm-hmm. Definitely. Yeah, I like that a lot. So you're writing just the characters as they are, doing research on them and all that. Do you ever find that a family member, friend, or foe has slipped into your book? Okay, so my husband, who I absolutely adore, has actually inspired a lot of my male hero characters. Um, Just different pieces of them. Yeah. Uh, Because everyone has lots of layers. So his sister asked after reading Vasilisa, she's asked, did you base Staver on him? And I was like, yes. (laughs) (laughs) We must be married to very similar people because that is part of what I loved so much about Vasilisa is I feel that my husband is very much a Staver as well. Isn't Staver awesome? (laughs) He is. He is. He's such a good guy. So would you say that Staver is your favorite character or do you have... Do you have a favorite? Do you have ones that you really don't like? Um. Okay, so I really, <laughs> that's a hard one to answer. <laughs> um, I, I really like all my characters. It's, well, I don't like all of them. There are some that I really don't like. So I could spend just an hour on characters. I love Vasilisa's loyalty and Hete's no-nonsense attitude, 
even when she's no longer heartless. Mm -hmm. um, Joseph's journey of faith and Halavent's growth from shallow royal. Um, Halavent feels like a little brother to me. He's like the one that I'm like, okay, I like you, but you really need to grow up. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I love Staver's sweetness, as we were talking about, Takumi's wisdom, Conrad's wit. I love the dynamics between the seven sisters. And I have several sisters and sisters-in-law, so I have a lot of experience of sister relationships. Mm -hmm. I especially love the Sanaho and Shisei relationship, mm -hmm. and I'm actually more like uh, Sanaho than Shisei. Uh -huh. funny. Um, even the side characters have captured my heart. So I'll resort back to my daughter's quip. Do you have a favorite friend? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I really enjoyed reading the sister relationships and the fourth sister. I don't have any siblings, and I, it it provided a lot better view into what it would be like than than a lot of things I've read. So I I really enjoyed that and it made me wish I had siblings <laughs> I kind of felt like when I was writing this it was like writing little women combined with fantasy yeah, yeah yeah it definitely got that that feel for it um as for hate I try to make the villains complex fleshed out people so even though I disagree with their choices I understand at least somewhat where they're coming from mm -hmm. I don't want them to be these cardboard cutouts that right just have no depth everyone yeah. has a motive yeah mm -hmm. So you've talked a lot about the, the growth that your characters take, which is wonderful. So what type of challenges are they facing in that journey? Okay. I like to explore difficult subjects within the safety of a story. It is one of my favorite ways to learn and to teach my children. Thus far, I've touched on prejudice, both on the giving and receiving sides, broken family relationships, and healing them. The stories we tell ourselves. Uh, Vasilisa actually has a bit of that in there. Mm -hmm. Faith, sacrifice, disability, both physical and emotional, use and abuse of authority, safety boundaries and what to do when people press against them, and looking past societal labels. I feel like all of these are important challenges to address in writing, and I will address other ones in future books. Those are awesome, awesome themes to be exploring. So I'm sure that this is a question you probably get a lot, but do you ever get writer's block? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <Definitely>. <laughs> um, most often when I'm at the beginning of a story and I don't fully know my characters yet. Oh, yeah, that sounds like a, an un, unsettled season of the writing process. So what is your process to get past the writer's block when you're stuck there not knowing your characters so well? So because it's often connected to knowing my characters, I take time to research more about them and also the culture where I'm setting the story. So I'm right now at the beginning of writing my next book, and I'm researching the setting in France. And it's helping me a lot because I'm like, I'm yeah. not familiar with France. I don't have family members who are French. I don't have, I've never traveled there. So this one's taking a lot of research and just absorbing the feel of it. I love it. One of my first clear memories of my friendship with Amanda was me reading aloud to all of our kids and her without skipping a beat in the other room without even looking up from what she was doing correcting all of my horrible French pronunciation <laughs> of everything <laughs> this I went and now I'll just like pause when I get to that word and it's like what is this word Amanda how would I say that uh -huh. so I don't want to be bothering your French speaking sensibilities over there <laughs> I wish I spoke French. I I can muster up a little bit, but yeah. I I enjoy French culture, and so I'm looking forward to that one. That'll be fun. Yeah. Well, I definitely will need someone to help me on the pronunciation because <laughs> there are a lot of things that I'm like I have no idea. They don't pronounce mm. half the letters. No, yeah. they they really don't. And I'm no expert, but Amber is a butcher when it comes to. <laughs> Name, so don't ask her it's so true <laughs> you know the whole um the whole philosophy of like you really shouldn't be uh, upset with readers who pronounce words wrong because they learned them from reading that's definitely yes. me like I wish I'd listened to more audiobooks as a kid and read along so I'd be like oh that's what that word is because sometimes I'll say things and my husband will just look at me and it's like okay it's like I, I don't I don't think that's how you say that. 
<laughs> oh, that's so me. And that was my dad. Um, mm. He grew up on a farm, a tiny, tiny community. Like there were not many people that he talked with, Yeah. And, but he read a lot. And when he got married, mm-hmm. my mom was like, you're very well read, but you have no idea how to pronounce it. <laughs> That's my boys with the Calvin and Hobbes book. There's the one that's called um, The Maniacal Psycho Snowman or something mm-hmm. like that. And, and they would be like, the, the Manical Psycho Snowman. And they, like I would like hear them talking to each other. Like, you know, you guys are reading at like a sixth grade level self-taught, but you don't know how to say any of this stuff. Like, we need to have some good conversations. So their new books that they've been reading are the dictionaries. And I'm really happy with that. Like, I walked into the bathroom last night, and on the floor in the bathroom, there's an open Calvin and Hobbes and an open dictionary. And I'm like, I love that. That is awesome. <laughs> yeah. I find yeah. that's one of the – we homeschool, and so we do Shakespeare plays together. And mm-hmm. I find it's one – added benefit of having my daughter read aloud parts is that I can correct some of her pronunciation (laughs) because she just you know hasn't heard a lot of these words and so yeah so do you ever share your writing before it's finished yes maybe Um, maybe would you let me be a beta reader (laughs) yes absolutely (laughs) No shame. If I ask I mean, you publicly, like, it's, in too, France. You have... it's in France. Send it my way. Send it my way. Oh, and if I, I would ask love you publicly, have your input. you have to be nice. So, <laughs> so, so do you? So you do share before it's done. Is yes. that nerve wracking? Uh yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I was like, even though I've done six books now, when I get the first response from someone, I'm like, do I dare open this? Yeah. I think I'm gonna go do some chores. <laughs> <laughs> Is it hard to share it with like your family or your friends, or um, are they so just totally supportive? And so you're not. They nervous? are very supportive, and they are also very honest, which is good. I need both. I, <laughs> I need you know, the constructive criticism. I don't want them to just go, "Oh, this is great," and then it get published and have them go, "Whoa, well, yeah." Well, yeah. So um, in sharing, I have two wonderful friends who read as I write. They're my alpha readers. And they actually get it like chapter by chapter. Mm-hmm. And one of them, if I haven't sent her something in a while, she's, she'll text me and go, hey, do you have anything new? <laughs> oh, so she's very awesome. encouraging. That's awesome. Um, that's awesome. And I also brainstorm with my husband a lot. I'll read out scenes to him. And as I said, I he inspires a lot of my male hero characters and he's very geeky and fun and comes up with these uh jokes and such that like so the kitsune in fourth sister he says uh stagnant waters only breeds mosquitoes i just uh-huh. love water occasionally yeah uh, i that love was that line. i was talking with Aww. him he's like he should say this and i was like yes he should <laughs> yes that's a great line i love that part yeah. That's awesome. So oh, I definitely a, a joint family effort. Oh yes, I am so grateful for my family. <laughs> oh, and I read each of my books out loud to my kids before I publish. So once it's gone through all the editing and everything, um, so it goes through alpha readers, beta readers, um, lots of rewriting. I send it off to my editor, and she polishes it up. And then I say, okay, kids, I'm ready to read it out loud. And they'll listen as I read it out loud before I publish. And I just want to do that to make sure that it's appropriate for family reading. Yeah, that's, oh, that's great. That's awesome. And you're probably able, like, you know, some books are really good read-alouds. They're just awesome read-alouds. And some books are just better read to yourself because of the cadence of the writing. And it's not a bad cadence. It's just, it's kind of choppy feeling when you're reading it aloud. So would you say that in your experience with having read them aloud, that they are written to be read aloud? I guess so. I, I, yeah. I read aloud a lot of books, and I'm not sure they're all considered read alouds. Yeah. But uh, so like Heartless Hetty, uh, I was so happy because my eight-year-old, who has never sat down and listened to any of my other books, actually stayed and listened to that. And I was like, yes, I made oh, that's it. that's awesome. That he's interesting. <laughs> Of course, he was leveling up, <laughs> leveling up as an author. 
That's great. So you said you're you're in the process of writing book seven. So how long did it take you to get your first book published? Um, about 20 years from first idea to published with lots of life and motherhood around it. I'm grateful that it wasn't published back when I first submitted it because I grew in experience and understanding and writing ability over the years. Mm, yeah, that's encouraging because I've got some books inside me from when I was a kid and this encourages me not to give up on them and maybe their time oh, no. is yet to come. <laughs> so with six kids and being on your seventh book and only so many hours in the day, I have to ask, how do you carve out and prioritize time for writing? And so what does that writing process look like for you? Okay, so the early morning hours are my favorite and most productive writing time. On a good day, I can get in a thousand words before anyone else wakes. Wow. I also do a lot of writing in the evening. My husband will take the kids and play with them. And they absolutely love daddy time in the evening. And I write. <laughs> I love that. Uh, story ideas, they come at all times between laundry and cooking, dinner, in the middle of helping a child with school, or at 2 a.m. 2 a.m. seems to be when my story brain turns on. <laughs> <laughs> um, to capture these ideas, I keep a notebook with me at all times, from a tiny one that I tuck into my purse to an 8 by 11 one in the kitchen. I write small, I write sloppy, but I capture the ideas and later I type them into a more readable form. Uh, so... Like, you probably have no idea how to read any of this, but this is my <laughs> notebook. <laughs> it, just, it has story ideas, shopping list things, reminders, just everything yeah. goes into it. And then I sort it out later. Uh, a better written, but no more. Actually, I think this is a lot more readable. But this is when I was in college and um, wrote three lines to a, a pay, a, anyone. What is that called? The page lines. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm very grateful for a computer to type ideas up on because my writing is very legible. <laughs> uh, I also research a lot. Names, cultures, geography, history, politics. I love the quote by George Santayana. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. History and politics are complex, and studying them helps me add depth and intricacy to my stories. For each story, I start by completing an outline which goes over the main beats of the story and character arcs. Then I create a spread spreadsheet. Okay, spreadsheets again. <laughs> That's me. Um, <laughs> for a character, sorry, chapter by chapter synopsis that I build as I write. So I have it kind of laid out beforehand, but then as the story develops, I go back and change things in that spreadsheet. It helps me keep track of the important elements without having it pages and pages and pages. Yeah. I love that. So, I, I think I need like an entire wall because I'm so visual and like mm -hmm. even spreadsheets, like if I can't see the whole spreadsheet, it's problematic for me. And so I think I would end up with like a whole wall, like whiteboard and I would just like spiral <laughs> out from the center and just keep adding connections. Okay. So I love so your we system. Have a whiteboard. That is uh, six feet by four feet that we just recently put up on our kitchen wall. We nice. had to cut a hole in it for the light switch because that was the only wall that was big enough. That but you work. made it work. <laughs> and no. I would totally do that for story things. In fact, that's where we do a lot of brainstorming as a family. We used to have a smaller three by two whiteboard. And now that we have this, the kids have filled it up with artwork. And I'm like, um, I yeah. guess I'll brainstorm on something else. <laughs> Uh, I do art with words. The rest of my family does art in more visual art. <laughs> uh -huh. That's... Maybe you should have them illustrate your books sometime. Uh, my oldest, my 17-year-old, I think she will someday because oh, she is be awesome. so good. <laughs> that'd be awesome. So how, what do you hope that your readers will take away from your books? So I want my writing to inspire the reader to think deeply consider different viewpoints, and make changes in their own lives for the better. I want to open worlds, expose falsehoods, and present truths in beautiful and engaging ways that will pull the reader through the story and leave them pondering afterwards. Basically, I want the readers to get, take away from my books what I take away from books that I love. I love that. So expanded worldview and empathy, and those are really important things, and it's 
can be hard to get without books because you just can't go mm-hmm. and meet as many people as as you can through literature. Yeah, especially in a post-COVID world where a lot of these kids haven't been around many people at all in the last two years. I feel like books have just become extra important for feeding feeding that need of exposure yes. to multiple views and experiences and locations. Mm-hmm. So, Maria, so we... My... Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, though, I hope my children do get to have that sort of exposure outside of books too. I want them to make friends from many different cultures and backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we met through Reshelving Alexandria on Facebook, and you are one of quite a few in our community who have membership in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I would love if you would share with us how your faith has informed your writing. Definitely. Um, So I am a Christian. I am a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and my writing is influenced by my belief in a loving God who is very aware and involved in our lives. I directly address these ideas in the King's Trial and the King's Shadow. Readers who generally don't care for religious themes have commented that they felt the balance was right and that the books can be read as straight fantasy. In my Hearth and Bard tales, faith takes a lighter touch, but I still reference moral right and wrong. The belief in an afterlife and continuing relationships beyond death. For example, when a man is speaking with his wife before he enters a battle where he anticipates dying, he says, I'll keep the hearth warm and the pillows plump for you in heaven. I have to say that's from Vasilisa. I recognize that. And I choked up in that scene because I love literary modeling of long faithful, loving marriages. And that was an elderly couple who had already been through it in life. And that moment of, um, of their saying goodbye to each other. I, just, I had a real tear guys. Okay. It just, it is what it is. <laughs> I just really loved them in that book. And I was, I, for being side characters, I still felt that they got some solid solid exposure and we got to observe their relationship and their their deep love I modeled them off my grandparents oh Aww. I love that that's fantastic so besides the the battle scene that he was leaving for that you just referenced do you have any other content considerations that you'd like to share with us and for our readers real quick I just want to be clear that a content consideration is not a content warning but instead it's just content that we feel that you may want to be aware of as you are weighing and determining if this specific book is the right book at the right time for your reader. And so that's, that's what we're talking about when we are talking about content considerations. So besides battles and wars, do you have other content considerations? So all my books are written so I can read them out loud to my children. And thus my books contain no swearing, sex, or gratuitous violence. I read each of my novels out loud to my children before I publish, but take this with a grain of salt. I read Les Miserables to them at the request of my oldest, who was nine at the time. Uh, she had heard <laughs> the story of, of the bishop mm, and how he yeah. had given the candlesticks to Jean Valjean. And she was like, I want to read this book. And I was like, you're nine. Yeah. I'm going to read it out yeah. loud to you and we'll go as far <laughs> as you want to go. And we yeah. spent the summer reading it. That was our summer school. Oh, and amazing. my other kids, um, my son, who was seven at that time, he mm-hmm. stayed and listened. And my five-year-old, she just likes to stay with family. So she sat in there and listened to. And I was like, I did not expect to get very far. Yeah. And we read the whole book. <laughs> oh, that oh, my goodness. Incredible. What a memory. Um, so it was amazing, that experience. So I did edit out parts. I did skip a few parts. And we had mm-hmm. a lot of discussion. We also read and discuss the scriptures together, including the Old Testament, which has many troubling stories. Uh (laughs) Um, So my books do contain serious topics that may be disturbing to children. Okay. Um, So yes, please see the content considerations. Yeah, that's great. So again, for our listeners, Maria has written thorough content considerations for all of her books for us, and you will be able to find them um, when you're done listening in our show notes. So those are there waiting for you. You're deciding if 
if these books are right for this time for the kids in your home or for yourself, I highly recommend adults be reading these too and not not just pigeonhole them into um, middle grade fiction or, or YA fiction. I think that, I don't know, I... I told someone last week that I just yeah I told someone last week that I'm I'm really just tired of talking about children's books because I think that really it's books and then books that are appropriate for children to also read (laughs) because if it's worth reading it's worth being read by everybody so that's that's how I feel about it if it's only good for kids it's probably not that good yeah yeah (laughs) probably not good enough for them Lewis in his dedication um I think it was in the line the witch in the wardrobe. He says, by the time I finish writing this, she'll probably be too old for ter- fairy tales. But um, then I hope at some point when you're old enough again for fairy tales that you'll enjoy yes. it. Yes, absolutely. Definitely. So Amanda was having some difficulties in the beginning with pronouncing some of the names. And we were very grateful for pronunciation guides in the book. But Amanda, what, what was your experience with with that yeah I had I really struggled with the oh I still can't say it Hete I yeah so can you tell us how you pronounce some of the names that are maybe a little bit trickier because yes I prefer to hear them before I read them in the book (laughs) and come up with my own pronunciation because I just kept calling her Hetty the whole way through (laughs) okay so um German is not a language that I really know, but my husband lived there for two years. And after I wrote the book and read it out loud to my kids, someone asked for a pronunciation guide. And I was like, oh, well, I'll go ask my husband. And I asked him, and I mispronounced over half of the names. <gasps> I was like, oh, no. I'm not the only one. Thank goodness I'm not the only so one. Like Peter in German is Peter. Uh-huh. And I'm like, I've been saying Peter the whole time. Yeah. And I'm like, oops. <laughs> So uh, here's some of the names that people tend to get wrong. Oh, I'm much better at Russian and Japanese because I'm more familiar with that. Uh, we had a lot of Japanese exchange students when I was a youth. I family members who are Japanese um, in Russia. I lived there. So oh Vasilisa is Russian. Um, I'm trying to think what other ones would be hard in the Russian one because they don't sound hard to me. Yeah. Is all. Well, the, the um, grandparents, how you say grandparents. Uh, yeah, the, and Baba, yeah, like Babushka. Um, in Russian, they put a Y sound in next to other consonants a lot. Mm. Okay. Uh, for Japanese, there's Shisei, Ichia, Sanaho. Um, I'm, I have to go through the counting numbers. <laughs> Yeah, just go through them. Just yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, that's good. And and like I said, you do have pronunciation guides in the books for parents that want to read aloud or people who are like, how but do you see German this? was definitely, German was the hardest for me. Yeah. Um, oh. Hete, Hete, Demut, Georg. Um, so George is such a funny name. I learned this as a kid that in Swedish, it's Yeri, uh, Jorge in Spanish. George in English, Georg in German. <laughs> Man. Yeah, that's quite the that's quite the difference. I don't how on earth I don't know how all the different languages have different versions of that one of all names. And it sounds completely different in each one. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. does. Do you have any advice mm-hmm. for aspiring writers who might be listening right now? Okay, so Winston Churchill said, success consists from going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. And that is so important to keep in mind when writing because there is a huge learning curve and it continues to be a learning curve even after having published several books. Writing takes time. It is full of mistakes. And as you work at it, your skill will blossom. Don't give up. Uh, Some other advice, write every day, even if it's a hundred words. Try flash fiction, try poetry, explore different types of writing, find what you love. Perhaps try writing in a journal. I've journaled almost every day since I turned 17 when I decided I liked writing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I've captured conversations, descriptions, happenings, and quotes. I explore ideas. Through the years, I've journaled well over a million words, and it prepared me to become an author. 
We've also talked about beta readers and critique groups. They are essential. Writing is a very personal endeavor, but beta readers help me see the story's blind spots, and they also Mm -hmm. cheer me on when I'm in a writer's slump. And you need that support and perspective to go from amateur writer to published. Lastly, uh, get an ergonomic keyboard. It's a lifesaver <laughs> on the wrist. Um, I have this funny looking thing. Nice. And it is so important. I was wearing wrist brace before I got this oh. just because my wrists were giving me trouble. Yeah, that's an inspiring journaling habit that you have. I'm going to share that with my daughter who just finished her first novel and let her know you should be writing in a journal too. <laughs> You should be be doing that. That's just incredible. So your books, you read them a lot, a lot. lot. Do you have any advice or experience with reluctant readers who you may just want to be handing the books to, but they're just a little little reluctant or um, lacking confidence? What would you say? So uh, I have a son who has dyslexia. My husband Mm -hmm. has dyslexia. Uh, it, it just runs in the family. And so I actually have a lot of experience with that. Uh, so I would suggest find a story that you love. Listen to books on tape and read alongside. Listen to the first book in a series, then read the next one. Um, for my son who has dyslexia, his for years his exposure to stories was through me reading them out loud. Now he can read fairly well, though reading may always exhaust him. It, it's not easy for him. Despite this, he's always loved stories, and I'm glad I didn't pressure him into going, you have to read this long every day. Right. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think I think not using pressure has been key in our home as well, with just letting the love of the story nurture their drive itself. That's great. So which of the, so if, if you, since you've... <laughs> Since you gave us advice for the reluctant reader, which of your books would you recommend people start with? So it depends on what you like. Uh, I write a huge variety of type settings and characters. So if you're looking for a sweet love story, read Vasilisa. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you want adventure with faith elements, the King's Trial duology. Lyrical writing about family, try Fourth Sister. For riddles and monumental character arc, Heartless Hetty. Um, Halavant's character arc is also huge in The King's Trial. And for nonfiction slices of family life with a mix of poetry and comics, try When I Was a Pie. When I Was a Pie. Mm-hmm. When I Was a Pie. It's something Sounds my like son it has said. a fun story itself. <laughs> oh, it is a fun story. No, That's one God. reason for journals. When I Was a Pie came directly out of tons and tons of journal entries. Yeah. Including uh, cutting a hole in the bathroom door to rescue a toddler. We had to oh, take a bar off the to wall to rescue a toddler who uh, wedged her elbows into it. <laughs> Ow. Oh. Yeah. oh, man. Oh, man. That's funny. So do you, you said book seven. I'm really excited about this, about book seven, now that we've heard a little bit about it. But could you share a tidbit or a hint from it besides the fact that it's Um, set in France and do you have other books that you're planning to write in the future? Okay so I plan to write a hearth and bard tale for each of my sorry each of my children and my husband Uh so the first one was dedicated to my husband because he inspired Staver the next one uh, fourth sister was dedicated to my oldest daughter because she is our artist I mean we have a lot of artists in our family but she is definitely that Um, and she's also named after her Japanese grandmother uh, Heartless Hetty was inspired by my oldest son in the dream he told me. So I was like, I have to dedicate it to him. Right. Mm-hmm. My right. current work in progress yes. was inspired by my middle daughter who asked, what if Sleeping Beauty wasn't cursed to sleep a hundred years, but instead to repeat the same week for a hundred years? And I was like, that's an awesome question. Can I write a book about it? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm writing about a princess in France and how she is cursed to repeat the same week for a hundred years or until she learns to look beyond herself and see others. And Amir is very much a part of this uh, story. She is my first anti-hero main character, mm-hmm. and I'm excited to explore her growth. I guess Halavant was kind of an anti-hero too, but he wasn't the only main character. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my middle son, who is 10, asked which story I'm going to write for him. 
We'll see what happens between now and when I finish my current book. I'm sure he'll inspire many ideas. He's my son who uh, loves spiders. Uh, he handed me a live spider when he was a toddler, and I didn't realize that. I thought it was a piece of fuzz until it started crawling around on my hand. No. So I am sure he will inspire many ideas for whatever <laughs> book is dedicated to him. Oh, I also plan to write at least one more book in the world of the King's Trial. I hadn't planned on that at first, but I've had enough readers who say, I really want to see the characters again. And the one reader who sent pages yeah. of ideas. And I so the when I write here book, is that we should be writing our favorite them. authors and begging them to continue writing series that they thought that they were finished with, right? So then pages be like, oh no, you forgot. There's more to this story. <laughs> so I am excited to write that. And it's going to be dedicated to this reader. It'll be yeah. like the first reader outside of family who I'm going to dedicate so a book to. Oh, that'll be awesome. Um, after that, we'll see. I have lots of other story ideas, but that's the next books that I plan on write are in yeah. those areas. That's fantastic. Thank you. Well, I think there's probably two questions left that our listeners probably want to know. What does the L in ML Farb stand for? Because we know the M stands for Maria. And I love Louise. Names. Louise, that's so pretty. So my name is Maria Louise Farb, and I just took the initials from the first two names to do my author name. Yeah, no, that's great. And then where is your accent from? That's one of the first things I asked you the first time that we had a conversation in person. <laughs> so my accent uh, kind of comes and goes, uh, and <laughs> I've been asked that question for as long as I can remember. I'm even as a little kid, I remember being at a park and someone saying, where are you from? Yeah. I was like, uh, here? Here. <laughs> so I was born and raised in the United States. However, when I was a baby, my parents managed apartments for international students attending Utah State University. I learned to speak surrounded by many languages and accents. Perhaps some of it stuck. Yeah, I, I could definitely see that being true. I've um, I love that article that came out last year about how they were they were seeing that little kids were legitimately like little American kids were legitimately picking up a British dialect because they'd been home for two years watching Peppa Pig. And so that was like oh, their auditory wow. input was Peppa Pig. And they came out of it with like a British accent. And I think that's so funny how like those formative years, what we are surrounded by definitely can can carry through. I. I hope they do a follow-up study when the kids are like 16 and see if they've maintained any of it or if it's all reabsorbed. But so. I think it I can happen at any age. I went yeah. to college and in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and came home with a slight Uper accent <laughs> my first semester. It happens at any age. And I picked up a little bit of a Russian one when I was mm -hmm. in Russia for six months. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in Russia, just... people thought I was from France. I don't know why. Whatever my accent was, <laughs> I guess it sounded French to them. <laughs> and someone say, "Ti kavarish po franziski," and it's like, "Niet, ya kavaru angliski." So a melting pot. Most, you have a Russians. melting pot accent, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, thank you so much for talking with us, Maria, and thank you to our listening community for spending time with us today as we spoke with author ML Farb and links to all of Farb's books that she's written so far can be found in our show notes. And we'd love to hear from you after you've had a chance to read one or six. And we'd appreciate if you subscribe and leave a review and check out the giveaway that we're currently hosting, which details of which are also in the show notes. So remember my friends, the stories are truer than true and we will see you next time.